Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the next panel of um, uh, consumer advocates. Uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce everyone uh, and, and be the moderator for the next hour. So hopefully, hopefully we keep it interesting. And of course, the, the, the topic is, is uh, in line with the theme of today and, and getting to meet the people behind some of these advocacy organizations. Uh, who we are as as consumers and advocates. Uh, and so without further ado, let's bring them all on here. Uh, we have Jan Walsh from Otiaroa Vapors Community Advocacy in New Zealand. I practiced that. I hope I didn't butcher it too bad. Um, Peter Dater from the Vapors Philippines and uh, Asa Salagupta, director and founder of End Cigarette Smoking Thailand. It's a pleasure to meet you guys. How's it going? All right. Good morning. Good morning for you. It's late night for me. It's 11 <laughs> here in New York. Good evening, uh, Alex. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, I, you know, uh, without further ado, I, I'll just jump right into everything here because we had a lot of great content leading up to this. Uh, very much appreciated uh, Marowa's uh, presentation. Uh, and and I, I think we've probably uh, all experienced that to some degree. And so before we even really get into who we are as advocates, I'm sort of curious about, um, you know, who we were as, as people who smoked. Um, and, and the first question that popped in my head was, when you used to smoke, did you, did you feel those stares coming from people it's sort of almost you can feel them judging you for smoking and 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 did you feel subject to all of that um i guess we can start start with jan what's what's your experience been there in new zealand with that that sort of pressure and judgment of people who disagree with you smoking oh you're gonna have to unmute okay there can we go. you hear me now yeah. um my last paid job was in health so um, I would, when I was smoking, I would actually um, stick a nicotine patch on every morning before going to work. And so I would try not to jump out of work all the time to go and have a cigarette. Um, it was uh, really horrible and awkward and I would sneak myself off and go and you know down an alley or something where nobody could see me peter how about you uh definitely alex um especially when uh, i would say uh out of the the necessity to really light the cigarette sometimes you become unconscious of the rights and the space of other people especially when you are in deep uh, thought, especially when I was younger. Um, I couldn't afford the car, so you had to commute uh, public uh, transportation, whatnot, and sometimes you're just stressed. You just have that urge to uh, to light that cigarette. Um, definitely, and as I grew older, I, uh, of course, uh, I was able to, you know, I tried to discipline myself, but still, uh, I, I see eyes rolling whenever they see a certain person at a certain stature um, lighting up a cigarette, even in a smoking area. They're, it's like piercing eyes, not just judging. It's like there's an ongoing conversation that um, he's supposed to be good, but why is he smoking? Stuff like that. And Asa, is that have, have have you have you felt the weight of the the stigmatization that's gone on? And, and I mean, especially among just just out in the public. I know you have another story, you know, related to your work, but but just just among friends and, and the public. Uh, well, actually, fortunately, I quit smoking like uh, over probably about 10, 11 years ago, and back then it wasn't as bad as, as it is now, but. Uh, even even back then, you know the 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 stare and uh, like the looking down on on smokers was there, but uh, 
I have to say that I, I smoked for almost uh, for about 38 years. At the beginning of the time when I started smoking, smoking was cool. So it was the things that actors, uh, singers, and uh, celebrities, uh, that's what they did, you know, to look cool. They have a cigarette in their mouth, in their hand. And probably that's one of the reasons I started smoking, because I want to be cool. I want to be like grown up. And, uh, but late, uh, during like about 10 years ago, it, you know, it's getting more like uh, less places that we can smoke. You know, if you guys remember, we, uh, in the theater, there's a student section and a smoking section, two separate sections. At least that's what happened in, in the United States. And uh, I, I Probably still remember the time when they just got rid of the smoking session. Uh, but uh, like I said, you know, I quit smoking by turning to vape about 10 or 11 years ago. So, you know, I'm, I don't feel that much, not as much. But, but recently, yes, I mean, I, I, can, I can tell the people, I still have friends who still smoke and, you know, like they became the minority who look down who look down on yeah you know for my for my part i i can actually pinpoint you know a really specific time uh and this was uh late 90s and i visited uh, asheville north carolina with some friends and uh this was uh sort of a, a a different kind of smoking ordinance that they had in in the city and it was one where private businesses could prohibit smoking and the city sort of backed them up. And so there were penalties involved and so on. And Asheville is sort of a, a hippy dippy kind of very progressive part of the South, if you will. And so when we visit, I was, a, I smoked two packs a day. I was just unashamed and totally, I, I was in love with cigarettes. Uh, but just visiting the town, I remember that vibe of just everyone kind of looking at me thinking, you know, who, where is this guy from? Why is he still smoking? Doesn't he know that you know, we, we don't allow that, that kind of thing here. And, and it was, I actually smoked a pack. I, I smoked half of what I normally do in a day because of the places we were going and because of just that heat that I felt coming from, from the people on the street. Um, so yeah, it, it's just a, it's, it's, it, it, I, I felt like that was a good way to kind of bring this in because, uh, you know, as, as Marowa uh, explained, and I, I think as, as some of the other bullet points that were in the, in the video coming up, uh, before us, um, you know, how consumer voices are dismissed and all of the pressure and stigma that we feel. Um, one of the points that I, I, I didn't hear in there was uh, that, that consumer voices are dismissed by portraying us as helpless addicts tricked by the, the tobacco industry. So not only are we uh, dealing with the substance use issue, but, but we're stupid too. Um, and so a lot of that, I think, is, is sort of that, that pressure and heat that we feel out in public and, and, and the judgment we feel coming off of people. Um, so anyway, I thought that it, it's, not the, it's not the most cheerful way, way to kick things off, but uh, um, I, I figured I'd, I'd, I'd follow that up with a, a pretty good joke. Uh, none of you are, are employed by or uh, um, affiliated with the tobacco industry, are you? <laughs> We're have we seem to be celebrating McCarthyism again here in the United States. So I figured we'd we just share that with the rest of the world since we have so many great ideas. Um, so um, I, I again before you got involved in all of this stuff, what were you doing before, like professionally and and maybe in your spare time? Um, how how close were you to activism and advocacy and any of all this stuff? Or was it that, that vaping kind of spurred you into action? Uh, and and I'll start with I'll start with Asa. All right, let me. Uh, it, it it really became a passion. Uh, I had tried so many ways, almost everywhere you can think of, uh, to get to try to quit smoking, and I quit. I did quit cold turkey for many 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 times with success overnight, overnight success. And then the next morning I'm back to smoking again. But since I found vaping, you know, it really got me quit. And uh, I started by just 
talking and uh, getting people forced to me to quit smoking by by vaping, and it worked. And uh, 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 it became also like a, a hobby of mine. You know, I started collecting different types of uh, vape gears, you know, and uh, uh, at some point in time, about five or six years ago, I was asked if I can do some reviews, you know, and uh, I said, yeah, sure, why not? And uh, up until now, I feel mo most of the things I review is what I personally bought, you know, paid out of my own money, so that's, that's nothing commercial for me. And uh, the happiness I see in the faces of the people who could quit smoking and uh, many, many people, you know, that I talk to try to quit smoking with uh, various uh, cessation methods. Finally, they could quit just by vaping and many of them already had also quit vaping. So, you know, they are living healthier lives and uh, especially also my son, you know, like uh, my, my second son. He finally quit smoking, and right now he's vaping. And he doesn't even, you know, most of the time he doesn't even vape anymore. Just occasionally. So that that's the 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 things that you know still keep me going to think that the people close to me and and it's getting broader to a sense that people who are not even I don't even know, but if you know if something that I'm doing can help them. Have a healthier life, then you know that's 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 one of the reasons that drives me up until today. And so, Jan, I, I know you mentioned that you were working in the health sector. Um, any any previous experience in activism and and trying to get people organized and and fight for their rights to safer alternatives or just a better life? Oh, you're muted again. Hopefully that works. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, not a thing. No. Um, no activism. No advocacy. No nothing. I um, when I discovered vaping, I thought, hey, hang on, why? Why is my government actually telling me that this is not legal? And I. If, because I tried to give up smoking, I don't know how many times over how many years, and um, then when the Public Health England report came out, uh, the first one, I'm like, well, this is blatantly ridiculous that um, this is not uh, supported, and that people are actually um, uh, almost. You know, well, at that point in time, um, it was considered that in New Zealand, the sale of nicotine and e-liquid was actually illegal, which turned out it wasn't. But you know, it was it was not available. I was having to import juice from the United States most of the time, and um, it it just yeah, it made no sense to me. Um, you know, you've got you know, people saying, oh, this is much better than smoking. It's a way out of smoking, but it's really hard to obtain. And so, Peter, um, was there was there something something about vaping or, or the issues in, in, in your country, in your community that spurred you into action? Um, subconsciously, uh, Alex, I, I think so. Um, Professionally, I'm a licensed teacher, but I never really practiced it. I, I worked for a corporate environment uh, for the first five years in my life. I manage people. And there's uh, there's this particular phrase that I've always loved about one of my previous bosses. And uh, God bless his soul. Um, when you want to improve the performance, I, I, I relate this with the corporate performance. You got to start by changing the attitude of people one day at a time. And uh, from an advocacy perspective, uh, you can say that 
I've always wanted to effect change, but I never really realized or never really thought of how the hell am I going to do it. So uh, going back, uh, based on all the experience that we had, John, uh, Jen, and Asa's experience, I personally think that vaping has worked for me. It has improved me. So whenever I get a chance to talk to certain persons who want to ask about vaping, it's just natural. So it's not a hard sell. You, you don't really have to, you know, pick a debate with them. It's like sales. All you really have to do is, you know what? Just give it a try. It's not, it's even more than the 30 day uh, a return policy period. If it never worked for you, that's freaking fine, my friend. But all I'm trying to say is that it has helped me. So these are the benefits, and this is what I'm feeling. And uh, most importantly, out of the 10 people that you get to talk to, if there's only one that will stick with it, that's a great win for me. That's how I look at it, Alex. That's excellent. No, I I, I totally agree. I, you know, with the the sort of step by step, did little bits here and there. Um, you know, I, I think uh, oftentimes I, I put a lot of pressure on myself, and maybe maybe others put some pressure on them that this isn't happening fast enough. Uh, but it, it really is. It's, it's all about the baby steps uh, and 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 focusing on you know the, the folks closest to you, and and at least you know, giving them the option to try uh, and and explore, you know, the facts about, uh, you know, these safer alternatives. Um, and so, you know, speaking of that, uh, I know that, that vaping is sort of something I assume that brought all of us here. Um, but, uh, you know, for my part, I know that, that this has been a journey. I, I started looking at, at uh, smoke-free alternatives uh, back in 2008, 2009. My job, I spent a lot of time on public transportation and you can't smoke two packs of cigarettes a day on a train, um, so at least not in America. Uh, and um, so I started exploring snus, and I think the first time I, I ever read Carl Phillips was looking for uh, information on Swedish snus. Uh, and then uh, finally, you know, getting involved with vaping and CASA, I learned about this whole broader tobacco harm reduction uh, field. And so I, I'm curious, um, are, are you, did you come to this with the understanding that there were safer tobacco products, safer nicotine products, or did you learn this over time and has your advocacy and focus grown to, uh, uh include those other safer smoke-free products? Uh, and, and Peter, I'll, I'll pitch it back to you. Uh, how do I, how do, how do I answer that? Um, I think, um, Alex, at, at the onset, um, I was just really trying. Uh, like what Asa said earlier, you'll do, you, you'll do cold turkey, you'll be successful for one week, and then you go back. Uh, I was at a point that I was just, I, I just want to try other alternatives. As to the amount of research um, at the onset, um, really no. I, I didn't have any idea about it. But then I started experiencing better things, like from the videos that we watched earlier. Um, I could vape inside my car because there's no smell. Um, I feel uh, I could breathe better. And uh, um, science is not there. Sci um, at, during that time before, um, science is not as abundant or evidence right now and uh, what moved me to advocacy is the curiosity as to why certain uh, groups individuals even the government uh, why are they against it so it intrigued my curiosity i'm using it i feel better and why are you guys trying to make it difficult for us so that's where i transitioned to uh, advocacy, Alex. And uh, as a very curious individual, I think uh, I became passionate about it because of the people that I have worked with, the learnings I'm getting from you guys, and also the uh, science-based evidence that are all coming out now. Well, I'll, I'll swing down to Asa. 
um, you know, uh, again, and it's sort of the same question, you know, in the United States, we're, you know, embracing the broader tobacco harm reduction category. We're also fighting against misinformation about smoking tobacco and, and forms of oral nicotine. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, did you did you have to go through that struggle yourself to kind of deprogram everything that you've learned about that? And 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 what are attitudes towards uh, uh, oral products and smokeless, you know, where you are? Okay. Well, uh, Alex, uh, for me, it's it's pretty much what what Peter had just said. You know, I I started uh, to transition and switch from smoking to vaping, and eventually. I did learn that there are other uh, tobacco harm reduction products, smokeless products such as snus and, and other stuff. And uh, fortunately, I had been to many of the conventions. Uh, probably saw at the beginning, I was in the background, you know, at the FC, FCTC in, in Geneva. And uh, from fellow advocates, I learned that there are other types of uh, harm reduction products out there. And uh, going back to my personal journey, uh, I, like I said, you know, I started by talking to people close to me. And uh, one day, uh, about five or six years back, you know, me and, and a few friends, we got together and said, hey, why not we do this for, you know, for a broader audience? And that's what I also, uh, that's when I started to give up information incorporated in my uh, review, my personal review channel, my YouTube channel. And uh, so it got on like a facts of vaping, you know, the topic is similar to that. And uh, we found uh, ECST in Cigarette Smoke Thailand about at the same time that Thailand uh, posted bans on uh, importing, manufacturing, and distribution of vape products. So we said, hey, we got to do something about this because this is our right. And, and we got together. And right now, uh, we have over 100,000 followers. Of course, you know, it's, it's, we can't compare with this with Kassar, but you, know, you guys have been <laughs> like you're in the States. I'm, I'm, I'm also, I, I had applied. So I'm, I'm uh, officially your member also. I had applied now way back many years ago. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's pretty much what, what I'm up to. So yeah, I do know that there are other types of uh, harm reduction products. And uh, I don't know, from now on, we will still have to fight. Yeah, yeah, and, and Jan, I... I... Uh, I, I know, uh, I actually, I, I must confess, I, I am not completely up to date on the laws in all of your, your countries. Um, so uh, I, I understand, uh, you know, at least, you know, in Europe, uh, snus is banned everywhere except for Sweden and I think Denmark. Um, and uh, so, it, you know, New Zealand has certainly been very progressive with uh, anti-smoking, anti-tobacco laws. Uh, I'm curious if uh, if New Zealanders have the same bad opinion of smoke-free tobacco products or oral nicotine products uh, and, and how and what, what your path has been to, to perhaps including that in your advocacy. Oh, they absolutely do. Um, it was kind of quite interesting at the um, outset, um, our Ministry of Health actually took Philip Morris to court um, for selling ICOS in New Zealand, and they lost. And that is how it was decided that actually, you know, um, vaping products were actually legal um, because the, the judge ruled on ICOS and said it was um, appropriate. Uh, it was in line with the um, our Smoke Free Environments Act at the time. Um, snus has been illegal in New Zealand for I don't know how many years and um, I think they actually kind of lumped it in with a, um, a piece of legislation that was um, designed to outlaw chewing tobacco. 
so they kind of said, well, this is the same thing. Until last year, um, when our most recent legislation passed, um, it was possible to buy nicotine pouches. Um, but our Prime Minister, um, in her wisdom, uh, decided that when she, well, actually, she said on Breakfast TV, um, on a news show, um, that when she was in Scandinavia, um, there was some kind of youth epidemic of mm. nicotine pouch use. And so that that would now be um, banned as well. So there's no snooze, um, there's no nicotine pouches, um, which for me makes long distance flights really kind of bearable. Um, and um, yeah, uh, ICOS is able to be sold, but I don't think it's very popular. Um, but I was initially a little suspicious of the heat not burn stuff, you know, coming from the tobacco industry. But once the science kind of like came out and, you know, uh, Constantinos uh, Vasilinos um, had a go at it, and um, you know, it, it, I think it's much better than smoking. And um, I think a range of products is actually needed for a lot of people. Yeah, agreed. Excellent. Well, I, you know, we, we're, we're starting to see all of the, uh, well, I don't know how far along they are, but the focus is being turned towards the nicotine pouches here in the United States, um, which is, which is really unfortunate because, you know, it, it, the nicotine pouches are, there's no leaf tobacco and that's a really good, I, I, I hate to, I hate that it sort of throws other smokeless tobacco products, which are, you know, arguably just as low risk. Uh, under the bus, but uh, in a way, they, we need that in order to appeal to people who have been so badly misinformed about uh, smoke for tobacco that, uh, that that something without leaf tobacco would actually convince them to try it. Um, so, uh, I agree completely. Did you have a hand up, Asa? Yeah, let's. I, I have a question, and I'm I'm pretty sure that a lot of people outside of the United States. I'm probably curious as well. You know, one of the things that we used to see, I, I, don't, I, I don't think, but I haven't watched baseball that much anymore. But, you know, like uh, where the baseball player, they have like something they chew in their mouth and sometimes they, they also have to spit, right? Mm -hmm. Is that uh, some, some form of tobacco product or, or what is it? Yeah, it, well, it was chewing tobacco. So, you know, the, the, the oral tobacco has different, different grades. Uh, so chewing tobacco is actually a wad of tobacco that you keep back in your cheek uh, and, and you have to spit. Uh, some people swallow the juice. Uh, they are braver and have much, much more intestinal fortitude than I do. Um, but uh, yeah, but that has been, uh, that's, that's been pretty thoroughly attacked here. Uh, many, I think it, municipalities, for the mo most part cities uh, before states will adopt uh, an all-out tobacco ban in their baseball stadiums, any of their their sporting event stadiums. Um, you can tell I don't follow sports very well because I can't talk about it. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so it, a lot of that's been replaced with like chewing sunflower seeds or chewing gum, and it it, it is kind of ridiculous because snus is uh, you know it's very discreet. Uh, there's no there's no waving anything around. There's no spitting. Uh, and and it's it's still something that I'm sure athletes benefit from. There was a big story about it with some soccer players and doing weird things with snooze pouches. Um, but yeah, for sure that that is a a chewing tobacco product. And um, I recommend anybody check out uh, the work of Dr. Brad Radu uh, if you're curious about tobacco uh, oral tobacco products. Uh, and of course, he has a book called For Smokers Only, which is all about switching to smokeless tobacco. Uh, and it was one of my earliest exposures to potentially harm reduction uh, back in, uh, yeah, late 90s. Again, uh, my boss at the time was, was using dip uh, when, when he couldn't smoke back in the kitchen. We worked in a restaurant. <laughs> you can make of that what you will. But it was still that, that, that idea that I could switch from combustion to smoke-free and, and, and do things that I wasn't able to do.
anyway. That... <laughs> um, so, you know, with all of, uh, with everything that we're all facing um, it, it from, you know, policy, from, from, from PR firms and, and activists out there and, and all the public pressure campaigns, uh, the, the public health hacking, um, I'm sort of curious about the, you know, campaigns that, that you guys have been able to pull off in your own countries and, um, you know, what's, what were some of the earliest ones, what, which, what worked? Uh, and, and what was the response from your community? And Peter, you've been quiet for a while, so I'll go back to you. Uh, just like everybody else, um, we have participated in a lot of public dialogues with the government, uh, with uh, uh, different organizations, lobby groups also, uh, both that are uh, helping us and those that, who are against us. I really can say that there's a formula how to get this done. Most of it, I attribute to, to a certain extent, luck. Second is our persistence. Uh, because my group here in the Philippines has grown exponentially. And uh, it is because Vaping to them has benefits. Uh, I don't want to call it a product, but it's something that's very relatable to, especially if you were a uh, combustible cigarette uh, smoker before. Just briefly, um, cigarettes here in the Philippines, they're very expensive. Um, because of the ongoing pandemic, when you see people, person smoking there's 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 a there's a stigma that you might you know you might be infected by uh by that particular person if he's infected by certain viruses um third because you're not allowed to go out it's very difficult now to buy cigarettes it's it, because of the quarantine and all that and i don't know about you guys but uh, when i was a smoker before i never brought the ribs right you buy one pack, two packs at most. So when you run out, it's very difficult to go out again. And, you know, so I, I think that also attributed. And uh, uh, finally, um, I wouldn't say that we are successful right now, but here in the Philippines, the, the, the groups that are pushing for regulations and vape, uh, vaporized products and uh, having it legitimized as a product is uh, definitely moving to the right direction. Um, simply because there's a lot of people now joining our cause. Um, it's just our stubbornness and our firm belief that uh, there's a benefit to switching from combustible cigarettes to smoking, Alex. Nice, excellent, yeah. I'd say you know, for, for our part here in the States sometimes, uh, or most of the time, we have to measure success not by uh, completely defeating things or, or changing the world's mind or anything like but it, it's more of the, the delay in, in implementing all of these you know harmful and dangerous policies um, so yeah um, Asa uh, you know how how it, I, you just said you got you had a hundred thousand followers um, and and, it, and I, I assume the same is true you have a lot of very passionate people um, uh, you know, getting behind you, um, what, uh, you know, do, do, was there any, is, are there any specific campaigns or, or things that you do that you think are, are most successful? Yeah. Yeah. Alex, uh, two out of, all, out of, uh, out of all the campaigns we did, uh, two years ago on right before World No Smoking Day, you know, we did what we call World Web Day be before the actual World Web Day itself. And uh, it started by, I got myself a uh, chest x-ray, plus I blew up the lung capacity and invited uh, our members to do the same. And uh, after we got the results, about two dozens of us, uh, we asked the medias to come in and take pictures. So we, we would just sit together, uh, held up, the result of our x-ray and all, I mean, 100% of the x-ray results show that compared to while we were smoking, our lungs are definitely healthier. 
and uh, I had spots. The spots were gone, and a few of my friends, a few of our followers of our FCs, uh, who used to have spots while they were smokers, the spots were gone, and the results were surprising to the doctors, to say the least. And the other is uh, we did a virtual run uh, with participants from all over the countries. Uh, we tried to get the total of 70 something uh, thousand, you know, the, the number of deaths per year from smoking. And uh, we got that. And uh, we wanted to do uh, like, uh, like what Australia did, you know, the roadshow. Uh, we got the first one started off in Bangkok. We also call it Vapor's Voices, uh, but Vapor, Vapor's Voices Thailand. And we got the first one in Bangkok, and COVID-19 came, boom. So everything, <laughs> we have to halt everything. But uh, we, will re we will resume that soon. Uh, a lot of people are asking about it and say, when we're going to do all these road shows, uh, we're going to go out and educate people, and uh, getting them to quit smoking either by, I don't, hey, but do you know that quitting cold turkey can kill people? That's a question I want to leave and uh, I'll be back at in three hours and I'll come and answer that. Quitting cold turkey can kill you. It's a cliffhanger now. <laughs> I'm going to be asleep when you come back on and I'm curious to hear the answer. So I'll have to, have to catch the replay. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, Jan, uh, you know what? Uh, what's going on in New Zealand? What's what's working for you guys? Uh, what's your what's the response like from your community? Um, the community at times can be pretty awesome. Actually, I recall um, a while ago there was we had an American expert. Um, they're always American. Sorry, Alex. <laughs> Sorry. Um, expert. Um, on an infotainment kind of program in the evening um, uh, that she spouted so much rubbish about vaping. It was, you know, people, you know, she said, it, you know, it's not water vapor. And then she started talking about people drowning. And like, I mean, it was like, it was, the whole piece was like so much madness. Um, they even started the show by saying that vaping was illegal in New Zealand, and um, that was post the judge's decision, so it obviously wasn't. And um, people kind of like came together, everybody was up in arms, and, and lots of people sent in emails. And I suspect there were some pretty powerful emails going into the TV network, um, like from the, our Ministry of Health. Um, because they actually had to put on a retraction the next day. So I think that was quite a significant win. Um, I mean, I know I emailed in on behalf of AFCA. Um, it was like, yeah, probably the worst piece of journalism I've seen done by our, our local press. Um, unfortunately, when the when the articles come from overseas, they kind of say, oh, well, it's just curated content. It's not ours, you know. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, they're, um, they can be actually really awesome. Um, we've had a number of um, times when we've had to put on submissions to the government and people have like in lockdown, um, been on Zoom with our Health Select Committee and, um, you know, really done their best to um, put over a viewpoint. And um, it's been moderately successful. Um, there are, you know, I guess, you know, it's government, so there's always compromises they make and some of them don't make any sense. Yeah, <clears throat> well, uh, as, as, uh, I just wanted to pop in there. Your your American expert for the evening, me, uh, was renting tour vans in the swamps in New Jersey 
before I started doing all of this. So I don't know how I got that tag, but here we all are. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I guess I, it, it sounds like you've all kind of answered my question. You know, a lot of people have have rallied to the cause because they they uh, experience the benefits and 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 see the injustice, the imbalance, and, and regulations and so on. Um, so I. I I, I had this question. I, I, I hope it's unique to us because it, it, it's kind of a, a crappy way to feel about what we're doing. But, you know, has, has anybody ever kind of gotten after you and, and accused you of, of overhyping this issue or, or fear mongering? And Asa, you're nodding. What, uh, what, what's been your experience with that? Uh, <laughs> uh, earlier, right, right at the beginning, uh, you probably heard a Professor Simpson also mentioned that uh, I had been blamed and, you know, like right here in Thailand, uh, things are getting more serious and I have been blamed that uh, I work for the tobacco industry and a few day, just a few days ago, uh, I was named uh, employees of Philip Morris International. I'm going like, uh, excuse me, what? And, uh, so yeah, and and uh, one of the things that we are trying to do is to save people's life, and and all of a sudden, you know, like uh, it it became quite serious. And uh, uh, personally, I went to uh, a meet and a seminar hosted by uh, tobacco control groups, and I was I got an invitation in my email, and I I was at the front, getting trying to. Uh, register and say, hey, this is my name. I got an email, got an invitation. And all of a sudden, I, I heard somebody shout, get out. And I was escorted out of a public building because they don't want me to attend that meeting. And probably they didn't want me to face a certain Stanton plans because he was there in Bangkok at that time. And uh, one of the reasons that they gave after that, they said that since we are vapor, we are very aggressive. Uh, excuse me. But uh, they said we are very aggressive. You know, we tend to hurt people and they don't want to confront us because they, were, they fear that something serious or some kind of riot might happen. So they threw me out of the building. So personally, that's what happened to me. Wow. <laughs> That was that, that, that. Yeah, that's uh, thanks. Thanks for, for sharing that. And, and I, I, I think I was looking at it more from the opposite side of, uh, you know, folks in, in, in the community that of, of, of people who vape, um, you know, uh, for on our side, uh, we've been going through the looming FDA regulations for years. And, and several years ago, people would would sort of fire back at oh, vaping is not going anywhere. You guys are just overhyping this. They're not going to crack down on us or anything like that. And so I'm, I'm sort of curious, you know, uh, uh, Peter, I'll go to you. I mean, did, 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 did people understand that this increment, this creeping prohibition was coming? Or uh, I, I, is, is that something that you're even experiencing there? Or, or did, did, did people think that maybe you were just being an alarmist and, and that their rights were fine? Um, Alex, it's, uh, it's a little bo bit of both, I think. Um, Culturally, uh, most Filipinos still does not understand the concept of harm reduction. 80% um, of the population, uh, I think, would just do an analysis on a cost-benefit analysis because we're a third world country, so it's really money-driven altogether. But uh, so it depends. Whenever I talk to certain individuals who has means, they understand what I'm doing. Um, for those people uh, um, that are you know, struggling in life or at least just doing enough uh, financially or economically, it's very difficult for them to transition from vaping or smoke, uh, from smoking to vaping because there's an initial amount of money that, we, that they will come up with. Uh, here, you can start buying uh, a mod uh, maybe uh, $20 
But that's already big here in the Philippines. So they don't understand the, the idea and the concept that if you put up the $20 right now, in the long term, this is cheaper and much better alternative. So that's where the struggle is coming from. Uh, whenever certain individuals in that tier asks me about vaping, it's very difficult because why will I pay a 20,000 US dollars now? Ah, sorry, 20 US dollars now. When I can buy a pack of cigarettes for $2 a day, that's just their thinking. Uh, going back to the harassment, uh, at least I haven't experienced what ASA has experienced uh, personally, from a personal perspective. But all the online threats are there. In the pages, everything. There's always innuendos that we are funded by so-and-so and so-and-so, but uh, not to the same extent that's ASA's experience, Alex. And so, Jan, to you, I, 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 this has uh, become the, the sort of the war stories of uh, being uh, 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 maligned and, and, and not really liable, but um, uh, painted as our painted by our opponents as though we are just stooges for tobacco companies. Uh, and so, you know, have, have you felt that kind of blowback from from officials or the community or, or anyone? Well, we we have one university in New Zealand who has um, actually excluded anybody from AFCA to uh, from attending any of their events. Um, Nancy and I used to quite often go to their summer school and various other things that they had, and we'd like sit there and we'd be really respectful and polite. Um, but what has what happened last year was um, the three of us um, so, tried to sign up to attend a webinar, and um, we were told that we were excluded from attending due to Article Five Point Three. So now we're the tobacco industry. Now it. it and that was quite interesting because I know that um, some, at least one person who owned a vape shop got into the webinar and they knew he owned a vape shop. Um, he had even kind of like been on the stage at one previous time um, in one of the events, but somehow we became the tobacco industry. Yeah, the whole proximity to tobacco funding thing is, is, is pretty ridiculous. I will say, I mean, in the interest of full disclosure, CASA, has, CASA does accept money from, from industry, uh, but it, it's not, uh, there's no two-way street, any kind of agreement. I will tell you the, the number of conversations that I've had with people at tobacco companies, I'm pretty sure I can count on, on, on just my two hands. Uh, and there's not much, uh, there's no quid pro quo, or, you know, it's not really a two-way street. If you're donating to our organization, it's because you agree with what we're doing. We're really not interested in taking your direction. We're, we're happy to hear your feedback, but this all goes through a, a board of directors, an all volunteer board of directors that makes decisions. Uh, and I am accountable to them, uh, not anybody working for a vapor company or a tobacco company or, or anything else. Uh, we all came to this as amateurs and very passionate about uh, spreading the word about how we you know, saved our lives uh, and wanted to share that with everyone else. Um, so, you know, I've, uh, I've actually run out of questions, but I do have one in our, in our private chat, um, looking at, uh, the trajectory of how cannabis has become legal in many places where I am, New York state recently, uh, legalized recreational use of, of cannabis. And we're waiting for the market to get established, uh, at the same time, New York state, of course has banned the sale of flavored products if they don't have a pre-market authorization from FDA. Um, but we're certainly seeing it here where uh, several of our states are becoming more accepting of and, and, and acknowledging the harms of, of cannabis prohibition, at least that, that's, the little, that's the little chink in the armor there, um, that, that they are acknowledging all of the past harms and inequities of the drug war. Uh, and I made sure to wear my, my Drug Policy Alliance shirt for the evening. 
Um, <laughs> um, but uh, I'm sort of curious about how, and this is this is the question that that that, uh, that we're getting. I'm going to try to do a, a good job of not butchering this question, but um, in that that path towards you know cannabis or THC legalization, um, do you see any parallels between what's going on there? And and again, I am not entirely familiar with with how cannabis laws are in your countries, um, so forgive forgive my American ignorance. Um, but uh, are there any parallels between that movement and, and what we're all trying to accomplish here with tobacco harm reduction uh, and, and lessons and advocacy learned throughout that and how that might apply to what we're doing? Um, and I'll, I'll start with you, Asa. Here, here, uh, here in Thailand, uh, cannabis just became legal. So it had been legalized, uh, but I don't, I don't see any parallel uh seriously you know we we have to think i i pro i tend to think that uh the reason they legalize cannabis is because there are profit margins in it and uh, there's not much entice that uh, oppose the idea uh, while vaping we have a lot of uh, doctors uh, so-called doctors and public health sectors coming out in drove and saying that, you know, you should, you should not legalize vaping. And uh, that's because, you know, we, we know that uh, it's because of the benefits and like Nancy is always doing this, you know, they have a lot of concerns. And th these are the people who receive 100% of their fundings through excise tax, uh, especially from smoking and uh, alcohol beverages. So uh, I personally, I don't see in my country, in Thailand, I don't see any parallel. Uh, we're going to have to do something else. Uh, we, we really, I don't think we can depend on the same means and medium that uh, can, uh, the, the marijuana cannabis went through. So no, no not in Thailand. Peter, I saw you nodding. What? Uh... Any parallels between cannabis legalization and, and what we're doing with THR? Uh, first and foremost, Alex, this answer of mine is purely personal. Let me just start off with that. Uh, first, let me establish that cannabis, vaping, totally, totally off-tangent products. Nothing the same for both. But to me, I think there is a parallelism with its regulation and with what we're trying to do with vape products. And it is on the way the regulatory bodies, I think, try to act on things. I personally believe that uh, these regular regulatory bodies just want to make it difficult for any novel product to be regulated not even basing it on science. It's just a matter of tradition for them already. So if you come up with something, I'm pretty sure whatever regulatory product that a uh, regulatory body that is will give you a very difficult time, regardless if the evidence is there, the abstract is there, the, the well-renowned scientist will say that this, is, this product is effective, but still no. To me, to a certain extent, that is the parallelism between cannabis, marijuana, and vaping products. Regardless of the fact that uh, they are really not the same. But since we want it to be recognized as a product, it has to go through the bureaucracy. And to answer the question of uh, the, the very difficult question posted by the viewer, I cannot imagine that despite the advances in technology, uh, research, and in science, if it will take us 50 years to, to regulate vape, vape nicotine products, the same thing as the, the uh, cannabis in certain countries, I think as a race we have failed because we are going back. We're supposed to move forward. And this is regardless if you're from Thailand, Australia, America, or Filipino. I think it should not go there. 
And if it will take us 50 years, I think it will be the regulatory frame, it will be the regulatory bodies that failed us. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I can uh, agree and, and empathize with that. I, I mean, the, what we've seen here in, with FDA authorizations is, of course, the first vapor product authorized through FDA is an early generation Sigalike that is very hard to find. It's not, it's not on shelves uh, all over the place here. Uh, the obvious statement there is cigarettes are, of course, way more accessible and way more popular than the Views Solo. Um, so it, it's, I, I think it, it sort of hints at this very, it's like they want to take it back to the very beginning in terms of their authorizations. And how many years is this going to take before we actually catch up to other parts of the world that have, for example, the fourth generation ICOs? Um, it, it's all, it's just a slow, slow grind. Um, but uh, enough about us. Uh, Jan, uh, any parallels between cannabis regulation, regulation legalization, and, and, and what, what you're trying to accomplish with THR in New Zealand? Well, um, actually, recently, um, the country had a referendum uh, about the legalization of cannabis. Um, the bill was quite interesting in terms of harm reduction because edibles were banned because, you know, the children. So you would either have to DIY or smoke it. Um, but anyway, it it didn't pass. Um, uh, not by a lot. It was it was pretty close. Um, I actually think the um, the public perception is that marijuana is much better than vapor pro uh, nicotine vapor products, um, which is is quite weird, really, when you think about it. Um, I um, I see some of H's question, and he's talking about fifty years of advocacy. Um, and evidence to reverse attacks on tobacco harm reduction. I think um, if somebody can come up with pretty much set in stone um, a good evidence of medical benefits from nicotine, um, you know, like with, um, you know, I know Paul Newhouse has done a lot of work on um, people with uh, you know, um, dementia and stuff, um, but I think it would have to be in the kind of like, we can give this to kids and they won't have seizures. Hmm. So, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting one, and I, I just on the on that that uh, efficacy for kids, and and I don't want this to sound like I'm endorsing this at all, but passing this along, and certainly, you know, for anybody out there, any researchers curious, this is certainly something that that should be explored. But I remember being at a vaping convention in Detroit, and uh, the woman who had her stand next to us. Uh, was telling me that she was able to help her 16-year-old son get off of all of his uh, ADD medication, uh, and he just switched to vaping. And so here, you know, we have, and, and I think this is something that's also uh, this. This is sort of the thread throughout all the, the, the range of, of mental and emotional issues that people face. Uh, that, that nicotine, in a way, is is, a, is sort of a mild alternative to really heavy drugs used to treat depression, anxiety, attention deficit disorder, it's, it's schizophrenia, of course. Um, and as, as Meryl was uh, presentation before our panel uh, noted, I, I think, what was it, 78% of people with schizophrenia in, uh, uh, in New Zealand uh, are, 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 use, are smoking. Uh, and certainly uh, people with schizophrenia have, have even said, I've heard people say this, that is actually an anecdote. This is all hearsay for me, but doctors saying you should try cigarettes that might help you with some of your symptoms. Um, and so now we have all of these safer options. We have some wonderful advocacy uh, here in the United States with people reaching out to, um, you know, people with, with mental health issues uh, who have become dependent and addicted on cigarettes, but because it helps them. Uh, and so uh, I, I think that's, that's, 
I think that's that's kind of what we're 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 looking for here. And I, Ethan Nadelman has brought the Ethan Nadelman, uh, founder of the Drug Policy Alliance, has also been featured on some of the pre-recorded content uh, throughout this broadcast. Uh, has noted several times that you know the real one of the things that really started changing minds was that there were these medical applications for cannabis. Uh, and, and once people saw those, uh, that, that, that attitude started to change. And I think that's, that's, that's very much the same. People are just in, in absolute disbelief that there may be any medical application for nicotine. Uh, but I, I think that's, that's just sort of one of them. I really wish we could just flip the lights on and everybody said, oh, wait, yeah, you're an adult and you can make these decisions on your own. But unfortunately, we've got to sell it really hard to people and say, wait, this can treat diseases and things. And 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 this is this is potentially one of those things that uh, can help people get out from under the grips of uh, massive pharmaceutical companies who actually make more money off of you being sick uh, than than you making informed decisions about your health. Um, so yeah, and sorry, I, I'm I'm the moderator and I'm sitting here ranting. I apologize. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I from from my pre written list, I, I've I've sort of run out of questions. So. Uh, I, I'd like to open it up to you guys. I mean, uh, is there anything else? I'm sure there's tons more, like we can talk about our favorite food and, and, and colored t-shirt, uh, but uh, what do you think other people would, would benefit from knowing about the consumer advocates who are, are driving all this stuff? Any Anybody? <laughs> okay, I'll unmute and, uh, oh. Wait a minute. Just, just give me two minutes. It's, it's getting too loud in here because it's lunch. Uh, it's 12, uh, 20. Oops. Hold on, hold on. Oh, there we go. This is the, this is the, this is the high quality. Okay, I'm back. I'm back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a busy hour here and uh, I have to get a move on soon. But uh, I just want to mention something that Alex, you just answered. The question that I posted earlier, part of the questions that I said, quitting cold turkey can cure. You just answered part of that question when, when you mentioned about people who got schizophrenia and uh, people with, uh, uh, corona, corona, with heart diseases and, and whatnot and stress. Uh, this, this was uh, mentioned by a specialist, a doctor who's a heart specialist, a cardio specialist uh, two weeks ago. Uh, I was with, in a meeting, in a seminar, in a meeting with him at the parliament. And that's what he mentioned. And this uh, got the, caught the, our, our dear doctor off guard. It was like he had to repeat his like. Are you sure? Are you sure that you know quit quit cold, cold turkey can kill people? And this uh, this this dear doctor he just turned around and said, "Yeah, I'm a specialist, so uh, I'm a doctor, and uh, this is my field. This is uh, my 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 specialist field. So you know, quit believing in all those so-called specialists. You know, the people say that they know because like." Seriously, uh, there's a specialist on the national TV, national media. They try to discredit web writers and say they are the specialists on electronic cigarettes when they can't even turn on the device itself. And they said that, uh, I mentioned yesterday that they said like 80% uh, nicotine is contained in a bottle of e-liquid. 80%, that's 800. Mm. That, that's what it, that, that, that's a specialist here in Thailand. I, I vaped some high nicotine, but uh, 80 was, was never really on the menu um, for sure. But that, no, not, not 80, Alex, 800. 800. 80%. <laughs> 80%. Yeah, that's nuts. <laughs> yeah, no, nobody's nobody's vaping that. Um, but uh, yeah, no, that that's an interesting uh, uh, take. I hadn't heard that before. People, of course, I was very interested in, in the dying from cold turkey. Um, I know I, you know I spent some time in a treatment facility for substance use disorder, 
and uh, there were folks in there for heroin use. And uh, I think they were having some, some issues with insurance because you can't, people don't actually die from withdrawing from heroin. Uh, on the other hand, alcoholism, uh, insurance uh, will typically cover that uh, if you haven't lied on your application, like apparently I did. Um, but uh, they will cover it because you can die from, from alcohol withdrawal. And so I've never heard that about cigarettes. Um, and and that, that just curious now. So, um, so uh, I, I think uh, I, I, I've lost track of time here, but I get the feeling that we're coming up on the end of the hour. Uh, and so uh, maybe for some closing thoughts, what, what do you guys each individually think, what qualifies someone to become a THR advocate? And I'll, I'll start with you, Jan. Well, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of patience, it takes a lot of perseverance, and sometimes you've just got to keep slogging on with it, um, even when um, you seem to be taking a step back all the time. It's, um, it can be disheartening, um, but, you know, I just got to sort of believe that we're on the side of what's right. And um, so that's really worth fighting for. Peter? Oh. Um, you just have to be, uh, uh, first, you, if, you, if you want to be an advocate, you must have an open mind. Um, meaning there's going to be a lot of science that you need to go through. Uh, there's going to be a lot of things that uh, you need to read. There will always be people who will be on the other side of the fence. And that's why I want you to have an open mind because you, you, you got to find it out for yourself so that your heart will eventually follow. Um, also, as an advocate, one must be a sponge because I've learned a lot from Jan. I've certainly learned a lot from Asa as I'm learning a lot from Alex right now because there is no formula. We cannot say that one plus one is equal to two in this line of work. You got to get the best practices of everybody else and then uh, pray hard that it will work with your government. And finally, just like what Jed said, never stop. What I mentioned earlier, the goal is just to change one life every day. It might not happen during our lifetime as the question here with respect to the cannabis of 50 years. But if in the future this comes to light, it is because of the contribution of each and every one of us. Thank you. Excellent. Thanks. And Asa? Uh yeah. What, what, what qualifies people to become a THR advocate? Just two things, belief and passion. You know, you believe in what you are doing is the right thing to do. Then if you have a passion, you got to keep on going, you know, keep fighting on. So belief and passion, just keep that in mind. And uh, my tripod is getting crazy on me. Yeah, belief and passion, two things. Well, thank you all. I, I absolutely agree with that. We do have one final question from chat, um, but for my part in this, I, I, I think I have to echo all of your, your, your statements. Um, this has been, for me, a, a, a weird curiosity with, with uh, legislation and, and codified ordinances and, and all of that stuff. And, uh, and, and, and then, of course, my own sense of, of justice and humanity and human rights and um, that, that just absolutely blown away that anybody would be objecting to people finding a, a safer way to enjoy nicotine or any drug for that matter. Um, and so that I think, uh, you know, I, I would say to anyone, um, please bring or be willing to develop your own sense of fairness and justice uh, and humanity and empathy. Um, all of those things are absolutely critical um, and, and of course, I think everybody would agree 
um, being able to uh, take care of yourself uh, in the midst of all of this. This is a uh, there, we don't have very many up days here. Uh, so if you can if you can take some uh, some pride and encouragement from seeing people switching away from smoking, that's a lot of the time that's all you're going to get. So <laughs> grab grab onto it and hold on tight. Um, and so appropriately, the final question of the hour is. Uh, do you have a message that you would like to pass along to delegates at COP9? Um, Mesa, start with you. Yeah, the, the things that I really want to say is that, you know, since you said you represent us, so please do represent us, not your own interest. Uh, you said you come from a public health sector, so please put the health of the public at the forefront. That's all I'm asking for. Peter, 